Greetings, and thank you for watching. This is video number one of a 25 video series through which I am going to teach you how to model every part to a custom designed 3D printer and show you how to assemble all the parts in a virtual environment within your computer using only free open source software. It may look complicated, but I assure you that it is actually quite easy to do. Plus, at the end of each tutorial, I'll briefly talk about social issues affected by technology and eventually unveil to you my own solution for how we can use technology to live more comfortably and become more prosperous. Here's a quick glimpse giving you an overview of my solution. As you can clearly see, this idea took some serious thought. I've been working on this project for several years and have covered all the bases. Community, organization, human motivation through self-interest, social accountability, resource acquisition, economy, and the efficient promotion of creative works in an era of open source software, high efficiency, and digital piracy. This is the real deal. I will share the entire design with you at the end of this video series and explain how you can get involved with the democratic process. So hit that subscribe button now. You don't want to miss a single video. Okay, without further ado, let's begin the tutorial. Today, I am going to show you how to install a program called FreeCAD and how to ask for help on the forum. This program is 100% free and completely open source. It doesn't matter if you're using Windows, Mac OS X, or Linux. All you have to do to follow along with me is download the program and install it on your computer. Open your web browser and go to FreeCADweb.org. Scroll down the page until you see a dark box with the word download in it. Then click the link corresponding to your operating system, whether that be Windows, Ubuntu, Mac OS X, or Fedora. Chances are, Windows came pre-installed with your computer at the time you bought it, so don't feel bad if you're like me and decide to use it. Yes, I admit that I'm cheating a little by using Windows instead of Linux, yet as far as I know, once the software is installed on your computer, it works pretty much the same way no matter what operating system you're using. Now, if you're an open source Puritan and want to encompass an open operating system as well, then by all means use Linux. But if you just want to get the job done for free and you don't want to waste any of the money you already paid when you bought your computer by deleting things, then just use whatever operating system you already have. And can we please just get through the tutorials without getting sidetracked? Yes, I know about virtual environments too. Let's just keep things simple for people, shall we? Now, since I'm using Windows, I'm going to click the link which will take me to the download page for Windows. If you're on a Mac, the Mac OS X download page looks pretty much the same way as it does for Windows. If you're using Linux, then you'll need to choose either Ubuntu or Fedora. Now, there are some instructions on how to install FreeCAD on Ubuntu using the package manager that comes with the OS. But in my opinion, the instructions on the download page are pretty long and not very clear to someone who might be completely new to that operating system. And if you're using Fedora, you'll definitely need to already know what you're doing because there isn't just a single page containing clear, straightforward instructions. You see, someone thought it was a good idea to just post a link to a thread on the forum and call it a day. So at minimum, you'll probably need to read through several pages of a two-year-old conversation. But hey, FreeCAD is developed by volunteers. Why suck all the fun out of it by setting standards or making it easy? All right, so I'm using Windows. After clicking the Windows link, you'll be taken to a Windows download page hosted by a website called SourceForge, which is located at SourceForge.net. Scroll down a bit until you see a list of links. At the time of this recording, the most stable recent version is FreeCAD 0.15. Note that it averages around 15,000 downloads per week, while the older versions get downloaded a lot less frequently. Depending on when you watch this video, the latest version may have changed. Just note the average number of weekly downloads. Now, if you look above FreeCAD 0.15, you'll notice that you also have the option of downloading a developer version of FreeCAD, which at the time of this recording is FreeCAD 0.16. 
The developer version installs differently on Windows than the stable version does. So to keep things simple, I'll use the stable version for now and wait to introduce the developer version to you until video 15, when we'll need to use it for modeling the timing belt. Let's continue with the download and installation. Click the link for the stable version. Remember, at the time of this recording, that is FreeCAD's version 0.15. This will take you to a page with two options, x64 and x86. This has nothing to do with whether or not you're running Windows XP, Windows 7, or Windows 10. All that matters is whether you're running a 64-bit version of Windows or a 32-bit version of Windows. X64 refers to 64-bit, while X86 refers to 32-bit. If you don't know how many bits your version of Windows uses, the easiest way to find out is by checking your system settings. As you can see, according to my system settings, I am running a 64-bit version of Windows. Therefore, I will choose the file with x64 in its name. After clicking the link, you're taken to another page that will probably show you a couple of ads and ask you to wait a few seconds for the download to start. You can see a countdown timer in the top left part of the browser. Once that timer reaches zero, a dialog box will pop up, giving you the opportunity to save the file to your computer. Of course, this will depend on your browser and your browser settings. I'm using Firefox for Windows version 38, so I need to click the Save File button to begin the download. Once the download has finished, I navigate to where I downloaded the file to and double-click the file to begin the installation. Follow the prompts through to the end. And congratulations, you now have FreeCAD installed on your computer. Note that FreeCAD does not update itself automatically, nor does it even notify you when updates are available. So if you want to stay up to date with the latest version, you'll need to check the website from time to time. And if you need help or have any questions, the volunteers who make up the FreeCAD community are extremely generous and therefore very helpful. Just be sure to post your FreeCAD version number and operating system whenever you ask for help. Fortunately, the FreeCAD software developers have made getting that information easy for us. I'll show you how to do that now. Start by opening FreeCAD. Next, click Help in the main menu on the top right. From the drop-down menu, select About FreeCAD. This will bring up a dialog box containing all the information the people helping you will want to know. Click Copy to Clipboard, then click OK. Now, let's navigate to the forum. FreeCAD has made it easy for us to do that too. From within FreeCAD, go back up to the Help menu and select FreeCAD Forum. This will cause a browser to open on your computer and automatically take you to the forum. But if it does not, then you can navigate there manually. Just open up a browser and go to freecadweb.org. Then scroll down a bit until you see a list of links below that black box from where we downloaded the software earlier. Let's read through the menu options together just to be sure you can see them. Features, screenshots, getting started, documentation, Tutorials, Forum, there it is, click Forum. Now, if you're new to the forum, then you'll need to make an account before you can post. Yet that's free, so it should not cause you any problems. Once you've made an account and you've logged in, you're ready to ask for help. Find the section that is titled Help on Using FreeCAD and click the link. Then on the next page, click New Topic. You're now creating a post. Give your post a title in the subject text box. Then paste the information that FreeCAD stored for you in the clipboard in the body of the post and describe your problem. Finally, within the Options tab located on the left-hand side a little further down the page, make sure that the Notify Me When a Reply is Posted option has a check mark in the box next to it and click the Submit button. As long as that check box is checked, you should receive an email when someone replies to your topic. As you can see, asking for help is really not all that complicated. But keep in mind that the people helping you are volunteers, which means they do not get paid. Since the software is free and developed entirely by volunteers, nobody is obligated to assist you. With that said, fortunately the folks behind the FreeCAD project are actually quite helpful and very responsive. And if you see someone post a question that you know the answer to, do a good deed by helping them out. By helping others, you'll be helping yourself master your own understanding of the software. Now, before we move on, there's one last thing I should note about using the forum. Before you post a question, do a quick search on the forum to see if someone else has already asked about it. Chances are that if someone has, then you'll be able to solve your own problem simply by reading the responses to find the solution. 
Alas, we're finally ready to take our first look around the software, which we will do in the next tutorial. We have one video down and 24 more videos to go. Today's social topic is direct democracy and why it's bad. Direct democracy is the go-to organizational philosophy behind the anarchist movement, and it is employed by many open source projects. Don't let yourself be distracted by the word anarchy. In the anarchist doctrine, there is definitely order within the chaos. The question is to whom that order actually benefits. For those of you who are not familiar with the mechanics of direct democracy as it applies to open source projects, this is the way it works. First, someone perceives a need for a public work, and rather than appeal to the government for approval, they decide to take matters into their own hands by creating the work themselves, and then give it away for free. Keep in mind that there are costs involved in terms of time and resources whenever anything is made. Not appealing to the government for approval means that the project does not receive public funding. Even if a project itself doesn't require physical materials, the people involved in the project still do. And if you don't understand what I mean by that, then look at it this way. If I have to beg for food, then I don't get to choose what I eat. However, if I am paid for my work, then I can buy whatever makes me happy. If you're feeling obstinate at the moment, you might be thinking that money doesn't buy happiness. If that's the case, then think about what it means to have choices. Did you have chicken or steak for dinner last night? Maybe you had something entirely different, like lamb or fish. Or how about this? Do you prefer milk, coffee, or tea? Living life with fewer choices isn't as rewarding as living life with many choices. I shouldn't have to gild the lily by explaining further, but if there's anyone watching this video who still doesn't get it, allow me to spell it out for you. The more choices one has, the happier they are. Not because of what they have, but because of the fact that they have choices. If you don't have any money, then you don't have any choices, which means your level of satisfaction in life is more likely to be lower than those who do. Now this seems to be common sense for most people, which is why successful open source projects actually do try to get funding from one source or another. If they're unwilling or unable to obtain a government grant, they often try to get funding from a coalition of supportive businesses or through crowdfunding. These are all good ways to raise money so that some members of a core team can be paid for their work. Still, let's not lose sight of the fact that if a project is open source, there's nothing to stop anyone from cutting anyone else out of the deal. Job security is bad enough already. With open source, you're never more than one fork away from potential unemployment. Talk about living with stress. Still, at some point in our lives, many of us romanticize the idea of being a servant for humanity, wanting nothing in return. But that's a benevolent fantasy phase most of us eventually grow out of. The problem is, people simply don't give things away for free for very long, because living without nice things is not as much fun as living with them. Plus, people don't cooperate very well when there isn't much to lose. After all, less of nothing is still nothing. What good is consensus if there's no recourse when someone breaks their word? That is why organizations that rely on volunteers need an unending stream of them. But I digress. Usually, nobody has a problem with volunteers doing free work for however long they want to do it. Generally speaking, the damage volunteers do, they tend to do only to themselves. It's not our problem if people want to volunteer. In fact, we often glorify volunteers because the community gets to benefit from a free public service without having to pay for it. This seems to be acceptable as long as the volunteers made their own choice whether or not to volunteer. But what happens to the flow of resources when a volunteer's actions cause other people to lose their jobs? Companies go out of business when people don't need what they have to sell, since what customers used to buy from them, they are now receiving for free. Sure, it's good for the consumer, but that's a double-edged sword when people lose their homes because they can't pay their mortgage. Certainly, new jobs do get created, but not so fast that you won't lose your house. Besides, those new jobs, if they are higher paying ones, are not for the majority of displaced workers anyway. After all, companies generally only hire qualified individuals, and not many people over 30 can afford the cost of going back to school while unemployed with bad credit. Therefore, desperate displaced workers have no choice but to work for the lowest wages. 
For many of us, we see open source as something that is supposed to lower barriers for people by putting free tools into their hands. But people cannot build anything without materials, nor can they earn any money if they have nothing to sell. I'm not talking about a potential issue for the future here either. This is a problem that has already started years ago. Since unemployment has been growing and incomes have been declining, resource control has been ever more concentrated. This has resulted in a distribution bottleneck and it is resulting to lost opportunities. Suddenly, open source doesn't look so cool anymore. However, the problem is not with open source itself. The problem is with the development of open source within a negligent society. Open source can lower barriers, but that bar cannot be maintained if society remains negligent of the people whom technology displaces. We need to take a more responsible approach to open source development. This is why, in the next video, I am going to talk about an organizational structure known as a republic democracy and explain why it's better than anarchy. Thank you for watching my video. I'm Clinton Sam. If you liked this video, then let me know by giving me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment area below. Welcome back. This is video 2 of my 25 video series teaching you how to model and assemble all the parts to my custom design 3D printer using only free open source software. In the last tutorial, I went over the various ways to install FreeCAD, specifically version 0.15 for Windows, and showed you how to ask for help on the forum. Plus, in the second half of that video, I briefly talked about how organizers behind many open source projects often adopt a philosophy known as direct democracy and explained why it is bad for society. In this video, I'll give you an overview of FreeCAD by explaining the workbenches and cover the important settings of the software. Afterwards, I'll explain the benefits of a representative democracy so that you'll gain a basic understanding of how we can have a more positive impact on open source development by making public engagement more profitable. Hit that subscribe button now and let's get on with the tutorial. Let's commence by closing the start page. Just click that red X. Now we're ready to begin. The FreeCAD software is divided into various compartments called workbenches. A workbench is basically a work environment with a particular purpose. Thus each workbench contains a specific set of tools organized not by function, but by group. Think of a workbench like a room. Some basic tools and materials you may find in an art room are things like clay, paper, paints, and scissors, while some basic tools and materials you typically find in a wood shop are things like plywood, saws, drills, and hammers. Sure, you might find paint in a wood shop too, and you might even find some wood in an art room, but overall, each room has tools and materials specific to that room's purpose. So that's what workbenches are to FreeCAD. Now that we know what workbenches are, let's take a look at a few of them and talk about their primary purpose. But in order for us to get a clear look at the tools in any of the workbenches, we'll have to make a new FreeCAD document. The easiest way to do that is to click the new document icon, which looks like a piece of paper with a bright yellow flash. Now that that's out of the way, let's change to the design part workbench. This is where we will design the components of our parts, and because of that, it is mostly concerned with sketches. I'll talk about what sketches are and go into the details of how to design your components using the part design workbench in the very next video. For now, just watch as I demonstrate by designing a component to a part. One of the main features that makes FreeCAD different from other 3D modeling software such as Blender is its parametric capabilities. Notice how easily I am able to set an object's size, angle, and position relative to another object. This is a strong feature of parametric modeling. It makes it both fast and easy to make changes to models later when we need to. 
By the way, one of the goals for FreeCAD's volunteer developers is to make it easy for us to link an object's attributes to numbers in a spreadsheet without having to do any programming. But for now, keep in mind that even though there is a spreadsheet workbench, that feature doesn't really exist. Nevertheless, even without that feature, FreeCAD still does a pretty good job of giving hobbyists like myself the ability to design many of our own products. Now let's switch over to the part workbench. Here, we can create geometric primitives, such as cubes, cylinders, spheres, cones, and torses. We can also create things like spirals and helices, which come in handy when modeling threads on screws. There aren't any tools for creating sketches, but there are plenty of tools for continuing to work on 3D models that started out as sketches. For instance, it is very easy to mirror components and fillet corners on objects that were created in the prior workbench. Plus, we can use the Boolean operation tools to make cuts and even join separately created components together to form a single part. There are even a few tools seemingly related to mesh type work, including the ability to directly create vertices, edges, faces, shells, and solids. However, notice I said seemingly and not R, because these aren't really the type of meshes you might be used to with programs like Blender. However, you can export these objects as meshes so that later you can import them into Blender in order to make adjustments and final touches. We'll cover how to do that in a future video. Unless I forget, the part workbench also has tools for measuring lengths, distances, and angles. Now let's take a look at the draft workbench. The draft workbench also has tools for drawing vertices, edges, and faces, with the added benefit of being easier to use. Of course, this makes it look like we're able to create meshes this way. Yet, just as with the part workbench, these aren't really meshes like what most of us are probably used to, meaning you cannot edit these lines with FreeCAD the same way you edit meshes with Blender. These tools seem to have been intended for drafting 2D models rather than for creating meshes, but my personal opinion is that the part workbench's sketch environment is far better suited for this purpose. Besides, if you need a non-parametric profile that requires a high level of complexity, then I recommend that you use a different program better suited for that purpose. In video 19, I'll begin teaching you how to draft 2D models using another free open source CAD program called LibreCAD. I'll also teach you how to import those 2D drafts into FreeCAD and walk you through the process of turning them into 3D models. Of course, I'll also show you how to solve common problems that you're likely to run into during this process. There's still more to cover with FreeCAD, so let's keep going. One of the draft workbench's strongest aspects is its ability to snap to constraints. It's a wonderful feature that we can use to move our objects around and orient them quickly and easily. For this reason, I use the draft workbench a lot when lining components up and assembling parts together. The draft workbench is loaded with other features too, but I'll cover them in future videos. That concludes the workbench overview portion of the tutorial. There are several more workbenches available to you, but a lot of them seem to be incomplete or non-functioning. Perhaps they were included in the distribution just to share with us what some of the volunteers have in mind for future features. Too bad the developers didn't decide to leave them out until they were actually ready for use by the general public. The other workbenches, which are functional, are simply outside the scope of this video series. Though I might make a second series teaching you the more advanced features of the software if this first series proves popular. Nevertheless, we will be able to model every part to my custom design 3D printer and assemble it within FreeCAD using only these three workbenches. By the time you finish watching all 25 of my videos, you'll have a clear, foundational understanding of how to use free open source modeling software to design plenty of real world products. Next, let's go over the settings. It is very important for you to know that the settings page changes based on which workbenches you had selected priorly. To know how to fix the problem associated with the settings page, we need to understand what causes the problem to begin with. I'll demonstrate. Keep in mind that you may need to close FreeCAD then open it again in order to duplicate this demonstration. Note that the start workbench loaded automatically when FreeCAD opened. Because of that, only the start workbench has been loaded so far. With that in mind, let's look at the settings page. Go to the main menu. Click Edit, then click Preferences. A dialog window pops up. Notice the two large icons in the left-hand column. They are General and Display. Close the dialog window and switch to the Part Design Workbench. Now go back to the Settings page by clicking Edit in the main menu, then click Preferences. Notice that this time there are four large icons in the left-hand column instead of two. General and Display were there already, while Part Design and Import Export are new. Let's investigate further. Close the dialog window again and go back to the start workbench. Now reopen the settings page. Notice that this time there are still four large icons. However, the last time we had the start workbench selected and looked at the settings page, we only had two. 
This behavior can be very confusing and frustrating to a new user who clearly remembers changing certain settings earlier, but doesn't understand why they can't find those settings again later. The reason why settings seem to sometimes disappear is because they may not have been made available yet. You see, access to certain settings are not made available until after we've navigated to the workbench of which those settings are associated. Now let's see what happens when we go to the draft workbench. Notice that this time there are five large icons instead of four. The fifth icon wasn't made available earlier because the draft workbench hadn't yet been opened. But now that it has, we can edit those settings from within any of the other workbenches until we close FreeCAD. Now that we understand how the settings page works, let's change the settings to My Preferences. This will make it easier for you to follow along with me throughout my videos. The first thing we'll want to do is change the startup page to the Design Part Workbench. From within the settings page, titled Preferences, make sure to select the general icon and that you are in the general tab. This page is divided into three sections, language, main menu, and startup. You'll probably notice right away that one of the text fields within the startup section reads auto load module after startup, and that there's a form drop down selection menu to the right of it. Change whatever it is currently assigned to, which for me is start, to part design. Next, select the tab titled units. If you can't see it, look up at the top of the preferences window. There's general, document, editor, output window, macro, and units. Now that you have the units tab selected, change the setting that is labeled user system to standard and set the number of decimal places to 3. FreeCAD can save backup files for us too. It doesn't do this automatically. Rather, if you resave a document that you have already saved, then FreeCAD will make a backup version of that document for you. This is not a useful feature for recovering unsaved work that you might lose if FreeCAD crashes so I have decided not to include this feature in my tutorial. Since these files take up space and are not useful for recovering from crashes, I'm going to disable this feature entirely. This is how it's done. Select the Document tab. In the middle of the page, within the section titled Storage, there is a label that reads Create Up To Backup Files When Resaving Document. Click the box to the left of that label in order to remove the check mark. Click the Apply button to save all the changes we've made up till now. Next, click the large icon in the left-hand column that reads Display. From there, select the tab called Sketcher. Locate the section titled Sketch Editing. Finally, verify that the font size is set to 12px. If it is not, then change it. Click Apply. Now, click the large icon labeled Part Design. Select the Shape View tab. There's only one section here, and it is called Tessellation. Set the maximum deviation to 0.05% and click Apply. Go to Import Export by clicking the large icon on the left. Verify that the units are set to millimeter in both the IGES and STEP tabs. Don't worry about the DXF or SVG tabs for now. We'll cover DXF in video 20 when I'll show you how to import 2D models made with LibreCAD. Depending on the popularity of this series, I may create a second series teaching you the more advanced features of FreeCAD. If so, during that series, I'll teach you how to use a free open source software called Inkscape, which will give you even more options for creating 2D objects that you can then import into FreeCAD as SVG files so that you can turn them into 3D models. After assuring that the units are all set to millimeter, click the Apply button. Finally, it's time to select the large icon labeled Draft. Navigate to the tab titled Snapping Settings. We won't be using the grid lines, so in the grid section, uncheck both of those boxes. Now click the OK button to apply the changes and close the Preferences window. That concludes the FreeCAD overview portion of my 25 video series. In the next video, I'll go over how to navigate in FreeCAD and we'll model our very first part to my custom designed 3D printer. That's two videos down with 23 more videos to go. Today's social topic is Republic Democracy. Republic Democracy is an organizational structure by which the population delegates responsibility for performing public works to elected individuals. This is in contrast to direct democracy, which you may remember from my last video is an organizational philosophy adopted by anarchists, under which individuals perform works for themselves, often claiming that consensus comes from the population's willingness to use free products. However, I must point out that this is a short-sighted argument because it ignores the fact that everyone can be affected by open source works, even those who choose not to use it. Remember, nobody can buy materials nor even pay their energy bill if they can't earn any money, and open source can lead to massive unemployment. Therefore, everyone should at least be represented. 
Never lose sight of the fact that all the resources on Earth are under someone's control. Thus, if you want any resources, you'll need to get them from somebody. When you do something for free, then you miss out because people are human beings with their own self-interest. Sure, you could hope for generous contributions from kind people. That strategy doesn't work for most of us, but maybe you'll be the exception. After all, if someone gives you something, it's usually because they think you deserve it. That's good, right? But if what you deserve is up to them, then that's bad. The problem is that everyone has their own opinion about what you deserve. To make matters worse, even if someone thought you deserved a lot, they're not likely to give it to you. That would be putting themselves at a financial disadvantage. It's hard enough just to get resources, let alone give them away when one doesn't have to. Yes, there are some people who do sometimes give away their wealth, but not enough of us are willing to do that. Just about everyone seems to already understand this. That at least would explain why most people don't contribute to open source projects. However, knowing the danger doesn't stop people from taking advantage of an opportunity to acquire free things. After all, most people aren't going to pay for something that they can easily get for free. But open source is not going to go away any sooner than digital piracy is. Thanks to technology, it only takes one person to develop one program that will send hundreds of people to the unemployment line. Still, we can't prevent people from giving things away for free, nor should we try, because it isn't moral to deny anyone's right to help others. We mustn't destroy people's lives by passing heartless laws that go against the altruistic nature of human beings, nor should we negligently ignore the consequences of technological developments by simply allowing a small number of people to act without regard to others. The solution is to accept the situation and embrace open source with public funding so that we may benefit from its positive attributes and actively address its negative effects. Lower cost and increased productivity affect everyone, especially those who are excluded from being a part of society's economic success. Not many people disagree with this fact, but there are some people content in believing that life is simply unfair and that nothing should be done about it. Sure, life can be unfair. Nobody gets to choose who their parents are, what environment to be raised in, or what beliefs to be taught. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything about it. Even though we were born without choices, it is only human to desire that our opportunities be extended beyond those limitations which were assigned to us at birth. After all, it's hard to be content with losing a high-stakes lottery that we're forced to play. This is probably why we desire the freedom to improve our own lives through our own efforts. But if unfair people do not respect our aspirations, then our hard work amounts to nothing. If we are to be able to improve our own lives, then this can only be accomplished if we have equal opportunity. And that requires fairness. It is the need for fairness that often motivates us to behave in altruistic ways, such as developing free open source software or donating soup cans to shelters. It is natural for us to want to produce work that makes life better for other people so that they will have more opportunities. It is what we would want someone to do for us if we were in that situation. However, working for others is not satisfying when it is unrewarding. Once people have what they want, most of them are not willing to adequately reciprocate. Regardless of how appreciative someone might be, it is only too easy to find an excuse to justify why one cannot do something they don't want to do, or why they can't part with something they don't want to give away. Altruistic motivation cannot be maintained without reciprocity. With open source, nobody is obligated to reciprocate, which means most often nobody does. Imagine putting in a lot of your own time and resources to develop open source software that becomes very popular and thus is used by absolutely everybody. Now imagine that there is also another piece of open source software that you benefit from. It is not nearly as popular as the one you made, yet it does something entirely different so you still need it. Now pretend there is a bug in that software that affects nobody but you. It would be very beneficial to you personally if that bug were fixed, but because it doesn't affect anyone but you, nobody will fix it. Sure, you could fix it yourself because it is open source, but you don't know how, because you're an expert at your own software, not theirs. Spending time becoming an expert at their software too, or recreating it from scratch, means you don't have time to work on anything else. Sure, you could pay a lot of money to someone to fix the bug for you, since after all, it only affects you. But why should you? After all, practically everyone, including the developers of that software, use the software you created. Certainly, you deserve more than just thanks. Yet, in this thought experiment, you were naive enough to make it open source, which essentially means everyone got it for free. For this reason, you have no money and no influence on anyone's project except your own. Had you made your project closed source and sold it for profit instead of giving it away for free, then you would have had plenty of money that you could have used to get that bug fixed. Furthermore, nobody would be able to blame you for rendering hundreds of jobs obsolete with reckless disregard to everyone's well-being. But like I said, open source is not going away. 
the best we can do is at least ensure the general public has influence over open source projects even if they can't afford to pay for support or lack expertise. This does not solve the problem of unemployment, but it at least gives the general public, whom open source projects are supposed to benefit, some representation. Still, republic democracies do have their own problems too. That is why in the next video I will talk about those problems and share with you an organizational structure I like to call democratic democracy. Thank you for watching my video. I'm Clinton Sam. If you liked this video, then let me know by giving me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment area below.